We're here in Bruntingthorpe today. Where on earth is that, I hear you ask? Well, it's actually uh, halfway up the country in uh, Leicestershire. Um, we've come up here today because we think that there's, there's, um, there's something that we feel we need to share with you. Today we've come up to have a look at um, an international living history fair. Uh, which is run by an organisation called Pike and Shot. Uh, we'll be having a, a chat with uh, Dave, the organiser, a little bit later on. Um, he's gathered together lots of, uh, lots of traders uh, from, well, across all the eras. Uh, that's pretty much um, what it's about here. I mean, I think I've seen a few Romans wandering around, uh, but I think actually today we are going to try and wander around because it's a fairly civilised, quiet environment and have a chat with some of the stallholders. People who do sort of 40s, 50s vintage stuff are quite often looking for originals. Uh, but obviously, once you start going back a couple of hundred years, certainly as far as clothing goes, uh, even if you do manage to pick up something that is original, it's probably going to be far too delicate to actually have any fun in. So um, this is where all the reenactors uh, go to get their stuff. Um, it's obviously a lot cheaper because it's all reproduction, but within that, um, just as good as the original. Okay, with me now is Joanna Tyrell, who trades under the name of Embellished. Hello. Hello. Um, so, you're one of the traders of this lovely market. I am. Uh, and you're covering what period of items? The buttons start from around about 1580, taken from effigies and portraits. Um, the main stock of buttons run from about 1620 through to 1915, start of the First World War. Um, and we cover most periods in between. It's only really a, a part of the Victoria's reign where thread buttons appear to die out from the archaeological record. So obviously we can't cover those. You are such an expert on this subject, aren't you? I am a geek, I have no life. <laughs> When somebody starts reenacting, obviously it's important to get the costume right. Yeah. But as, as you stay in reenacting for longer and longer, you start to wonder about how to solve the storage problems of, say, carrying keys or perhaps money or mobile phones. Well, the dreaded phone, the yes. Um, yes. And items such as pockets, reticules, pocketbooks can solve that storage issue whilst maintaining a completely authentic look. But the thing with buttons, particularly the thread buttons, is that very few of them have survived the archaeological record, but the brass rings that many of them were wound around have survived, but it's, it was not immediately apparent what the rings were for. But in, in the context of a, a button, they do make sense. Um, some of them work around felted wool cords, particularly earlier buttons are. Um, so, for example, a dorset knot button um, is worked around a felted core and takes on the shape of an acorn. Um, a mite button is worked around a ring of thread and was actually based on the reverse side of the, the Hebrew coin, the mite. Oh, okay. And it, it's, in, in size wise, it's actually quite a small button yeah. and it's maybe just under a centimetre across, so they're quite small. Good luck with your stall. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for talking to Thank us. Thank you. Okay, now with me is uh, Charlotte Rain, um, and you're producing corsetry from, sorry, which periods again? From the late 1500s, from the Elizabethan time up to Edwardian at the moment, but as the demand's growing, looking to do more into 1920s and 1940s um, corsetry and underwear as well. So there must be quite a lot of technology changes in that period. I mean, very much so. Um, you start off with very early corsets using whalebone um, and reed. Uh, obviously, whalebone isn't widely available now, um, but we use synthetic whalebone to mimic that. As it progresses, as it goes later on into the Victorian era, you get mass production um, and you start to get the invention of um, spiral steels and, and flat steel bones a lot stronger um, with metal eyelets. Right. So now you see, because initially when I see your stall I think, corset tree, there's a lady sitting at home with a sewing machine. But now I'm thinking, no, actually, there's, there's some big industrial press and, and some nasty metalworking tools. Going. There, there are. There's a different side of it. You see the, the finished delicate item but you have a bit of hardware, lots of heavy duty pliers and presses for the eyelets and so on. But then with the earlier corsets, it's sitting down with a lot of hand sewing to mimic the ones of that time. Yeah, okay. Um, so an internet search 
Um, if, if we uh, get Charlotte Rain here, yes, you can get the spelling, lovely, mm -hmm. um, then they'll be able to find you and they yeah, can purchase, that's right. purchase standard items or contact you if they need something specific. Yeah, there's a full range uh, available online. Um, people can shop online or if they want something made to measure or made in um, a particular fabric, they can just contact me directly. Okay. And, um, now, I must up. admit, a lot of these people or a lot of the people that we, we kind of bump into mm -hmm. um, find that there's generally an event. Mm. So if someone's thinking, this is the event I mm. need my course in, yes. how long before are they going to need to contact you? To make they need to they contact work? me six to eight weeks before six, eight weeks. Um, okay. because they take a, a good couple of days to, to make and need to spend some time um, just liaising with the customer, making sure they've got exactly what they want. Um, when there are um, stock items available, uh, they can go to the website and they'll be listed there so they can buy them straight away. Fantastic. Okay. Right, Charlotte, thank you very much thank for your you time. Thank you very much. I hope you make lots of profit here today. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> uh, now joining me is uh, Christina. Hello. Hi. And sorry, I can't pronounce this. Could you pronounce the company name? For <laughs> yeah, it's Nelenia Patterns. Nel Nelenia Patterns, mm -hmm. right, okay. Uh, so. Your patterns uh, range from what periods? Um, we start sometime around the Middle Ages and it goes up to 1940s. Okay, um, and so you're also doing some hats here and I see there's lots of buckles and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and you've also got these wonderful dresses that we see in the background. Um, and they obviously, they are your masterpieces really, aren't they? Well, yeah. <laughs> but is that what dragged you into all of this? Is the, was it the dressmaking to start with? Yeah, sure, yeah. the costuming. Uh -huh. That's fair enough. So, so how long have you been doing all this sort of stuff now? Actually, for over 10 years. Oh, wow. And you still have fingers. I always imagine yes. that anyone that works with a needle and thread after five or 10 years is just going to be raggedy ends. Well, yeah, so. it's all right. <laughs> Okay, so now these are quite extreme garments, mm -hmm. uh, as you were explaining to me earlier, there are many layers to one yeah. of these dresses, rather than just going, oh that's a nice dress, is actually, um, so typically how, how many sorts of layers on, on a full outfit would there be? Oh, I think probably the lowest you could go might be two, three, right. and up from there. <laughs> yes, okay. It can be found online somewhere? Yes, hopefully. of course. Um, to put some sort of internet search on your company name, I guess we'll do that. Have we got that well, in yeah. shot? Now, really, this is bespoke. The dresses are all bespoke. That, yes. That's your top line, product line. Mm -hmm. um, so if someone wants one of these garments, how long is it going to take you to put it together for them? Um, it depends on the workload, obviously, but um, I would usually ask something like three months. Three months. Okay, Definitely, right. yeah. And I'm guessing actually you've probably made a few wedding dresses in your time. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> a lot, actually. Excellent. Right. Okay, then, Christina, thank you very much for talking to us. I wish thank you, you. Every, every success with the day. Thanks. Cheers. Okay, so joining me now is this Dave Allen, isn't it? It is. Yes, yes, I thought it was. My memory's not so good as it used to be. Um, now, you're organising this under the banner of. I could shot events, limited. Okay, now we've had a look around today, uh -huh. and what we're seeing is pretty much medieval to Napoleonic's, some just about getting into the 1900s. Uh -huh. We were expecting to see some, some, um, some First World War, Second World War stuff, but I guess that would have filled the hall on its own, wouldn't it? Well, the problem we've got is First World War chap is in the Netherlands this weekend. He's normally oh, here. Right. so. That's our first world war. We are wanting yeah. to get more second world war traders, <laughs> um, but yeah, we are expanding the show. Uh, this is our first day, first event, yes. sorry, at this venue. Oh, okay. So it's a brand new venue for us, and as you can see, well, the people found it. Okay, now we did, wandering around, we did see some weaponry. Yep. Um, I'm presuming that anything that is projectile weapon is fully all the licenses and everything's required. Every trader has a responsibility for the products that they sell. We have a policy whereby we have a restrictive trading practice uh, according to British law. So nobody can sell anything to um, anybody that is either unlicensed, unsuitable or underage. Right. So we provide a full range of weaponry. Uh, we don't have any tanks yet, but we're working on it. <laughs> uh, although you can buy a medieval tank known as a suit of armour. Uh, yeah, so, well, that's true, yes. I mean, yeah. some of the suits of armour we've seen around here. Uh, some stunning. of these people work for the Royal Armouries. Originally, yes. this fair was medieval. 
Right. When I took it on, I started to expand it for the other owners, and when we bought it, we made a, a positive choice to not have too many of the same product. And so we're back here again in October. October the 28th to the 30th, the last weekend right. of October. Okay. Doors open on Friday the 28th at midday yeah. until 6 p.m. and then Saturday and Sunday, 10 till 5 Saturday, 10 till 4 Sunday. Right. Pikeandshop.com. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, well, perhaps we'll, we'll, we might come along to the next one, although it's a little bit of a journey for us. But um, yes, we'll uh, certainly be telling everyone that if they want anything special, this is going to be the place to get it. And if you know any traders that sell your type of equipment, mm. please get in touch. Will do. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dave. You're welcome. Thank See you. you soon. Thank you.